Beth Talbert. I am the orthopedic clinical navigator here at Redmond. I am an RN and I am orthopedic nurse certified. I would like to welcome all of you to our pre-op class, joint venture pre-op class. Today we're going to be talking about total hip replacements and total knee replacements. We have a lot of information for you in a short amount of time. You should have a folder that was given to you also that has a copy of our PowerPoint and everything we're saying and some other information in it also. Also, you have my business card with my name and phone number on it. So if you were to have some questions after you see the video, please feel free to call me. And you can call me here at the hospital on my hospital number. If I'm unavailable to answer the phone, please leave a message and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. So here today, we're going to be um, talking about, as I said, total hip replacements and total knee replacements. Our class objectives is for you to know who your health care team is. You all are part of our Enhanced Surgical Recovery Program, and what we will talk more about that throughout our video, but what that is, that is an improved process that we do with our joint replacement patients and it helps with post-op nausea and it also helps with your post-op pain so that you have a better experience while you're here at Redmond in the hospital. We want you to know what you need to do to prepare for your surgery. We're gonna be talking about anticipating any needs that you have at your home, what you need to pack to bring with you here to the hospital, and we're gonna be talking about your entire inpatient experience here at the hospital. We will talk about your rehab after discharge and um, we're going to be talking about what you need to do for yourself to prepare for your discharge from the hospital. In your folders, you have the copy of our PowerPoint. You have information about what's going to happen to you here in the hospital. And then you also have a survey letter to let us know um, how we did here at the hospital. If there's something that we need to improve, let us know because if we, didn't, if we don't know, we wouldn't improve it. So it's up to you to let us know from the eyes of the patient and from the eyes of a family member, if there's something we need to improve upon, please let us know. You need to know who your healthcare team is. So we're gonna be talking about that. First off, your orthopedic surgeon. He's first and foremost. You, have a, you will have an anesthesiologist that will be assigned to you the day of your surgery. You have several people, a part of your nursing team. You, have a phys you will have physical therapists, you will have occupational therapists. I am Beth and I am your orthopedic clinical navigator. You also will have an anesthesia nurse and you will have a discharge planner that is working with you while you're here at the hospital. Today at class, we have Sarah with physical therapy and occupational therapy. Amy is our nurse discharge planner. I will be talking about the nursing part and what to expect here at the hospital. And I'm also going to talk about what you need to pack. So that's coming. And then not last but not least is Michelle with anesthesia. I would like to thank you all for listening to our video to know what to expect while you're here and to learning about your total joint replacement. And thank you for choosing Redmond. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm a physical therapist here and I want to give you an idea about what to expect when you come to have your joint replaced um, from physical therapy and occupational therapy. You'll have surgery and be placed up here on the fourth floor and we'll begin physical therapy the day of your surgery. We're going to come in and help you up, show you how to get to the side of the bed, show you how to stand up, um, and if everything's going great, we will walk a little bit. We, would, we just want to be moving around so you're not laying in bed for a whole day without getting up. So um, that's the first day. Then in the morning, we'll come in. Somebody will help you up, help you get dressed, and move over to the recliner that's right by your bed. When it's time for physical therapy, we'll come to get you, and we'll bring you down the hall um, to the gym. And you'll have physical therapy in the gym. You'll be working with your physical therapist um, but there will also be other people there working with their physical therapist who have also had their hip or knee replaced. Um, you'll be working one-on-one -on -one so that you learn how to get in and out of bed by yourself, stand up and sit down by yourself. We'll walk further and further and further. We'll also do some exercises. 
Um, in your exercise, in your folder packet, there's an exercise paper. Um, these are the exercises that we get started with, and these exercises become your homework when you go home. Um, so I'll go through them briefly. You can start practicing these exercises now to get your leg used to the idea of what you're going to ask it to do after surgery. The first exercise is called ankle pumps. When you do ankle pumps, you move your feet up and down, big and slow. Um, you want to pump both feet. Um, and you want to do ankle pumps little bits all throughout the day. So I tell people when the, when you, if you keep the TV on, let commercials remind you to do ankle pumps. So every 10 minutes or so, you're pumping those feet 10 or 20 times up and down. What it does is it helps circulate your blood through your legs to help prevent blood clots. It's really easy, but it's really important. The next exercise is called a quad set. So for a quad set, what you do is you tighten your thigh muscle up real tight, squeeze it, and then relax it. Um, it kind of feels like you're pressing your knee as flat down on the bed as you can. Squeeze, 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 and then relax. Um, the next exercise is called a heel slide. So you slide your heel on the bed, working on bending your knee up and down. Then is terminal knee extension. And you'll see in that picture, there's a little blanket rolled up and tucked underneath your knee. So your knee is propped up a little bit and you're doing a little kick with the lower part of your leg. Um, after that, it's called a straight leg raise. So for that one, you keep your knee really straight and you lift your whole leg up and down, um, a few inches up and then down and relax. Try to keep your knee as straight as you can the whole time. And this exercise is the hard one. Sometimes it takes a little while to get going. After that is abduction and adduction, which is just fancy words for slide your leg out to the side and back in. Just right over the bed like a windshield wiper. The last exercise is not really an exercise, it's more of a position and it really is important for those people having their knee replaced. Um, when you're in the bed or in the recliner resting and relaxing, you want to take a towel, roll it up and prop it underneath your ankle. What this does is it positions your leg um, so that your knee can have lots of opportunity to stretch back out. Following a knee replacement surgery, you run the risk of getting tight in the back of your knee, and so you want to work on stretching your knee out nice and straight. If you're having a hip replacement, this is not super important for you. If you want to prop your foot on a, a rolled up towel, you can, but it's not vital to the recovery of your surgery. Um, so those are the exercises we get started with. Also in physical therapy, we want to work with you so that you learn how to do everything you need to do to be able to go home and be there safely. So take a look around your house. If you're going to go stay with somebody else, look around their house. Make some notes if you need to, but let us know the things you need to do to go home safely. Some people have a few stairs to get in the door. Is there a rail? Is it on the left or the right? Two rails or no rails? Some people have a whole flight of stairs to go up. Or it could be you've got a really high bed or maybe a narrow hallway or a tiny bathroom, but just anything that you think seems uh, tricky, um, let us know what those things are and we will try to practice it or simulate it or at the very least talk about it so you have a plan of what you're going to do when you get home. And that's the goal of physical therapy, is getting you moving around safely so that you can move from the hospital back into and around your house. Now, everybody is going to need a walker when they go home. Um, if you already have a walker, that's great. You might need to get a walker before surgery. If you're trying to figure out what kind of walker you need, we typically uh, work with people with walkers that have zero wheels or two wheels. Um, we do not typically work with walkers that have four wheels or swivel wheels. So if you'll get your walker, have your friend or your family bring it up to you once you're in your room on the fourth floor, um, your physical therapist will want to practice with you and your walker to make sure it's safe, it's set the right height, and you're using your walker safely and correctly. And what we want to avoid is is you getting home and then getting your walker and that not being the best thing for you. We want to have figured out all the problems before you go home so it's smooth sailing when you leave. So the next thing I want to talk about is your do's and your don'ts after surgery. 
So if you are having a knee replacement, you can bend your knee, you can straighten your knee, you can move your leg all around. The only restriction following a knee replacement is you're not going to plant all your weight on, on your surgery leg and pivot on it. That's the only restriction. You can turn your foot with it touching the floor, just not with all your weight planted on it. So if you like to do the twist, go home, do it now, get it out of your system. It'll be a little while. Your doctor will let you know when you can return to activities that involve pivoting with your weight planted on your leg. So if you're having a hip replacement, there are two types of hip replacement. First, I'll talk about posterior hip replacement precautions. There are three hip precautions if you're having a posterior hip replacement. The first precaution is you can only bend your hip 90 degrees. What that means is a 90 degree bend between your, between your leg and your body. That's the most that you can bend your hip. So you can lift your knee as high as your hip. You can bend your shoulders over halfway. You can squat about that much, but you're never going to bend your hip more than 90 degrees. That's the most. Um, next, um, your handout says don't let your leg move inward past your navel. So what that means is if you had an imaginary middle line that went through your nose, through your belly button, and all the way down, your leg can come to that imaginary midline of your body, but it should not cross the midline of your body. So when we are walking with you, we're going to practice making turns without crossing your feet. Um, you, you shouldn't cross your ankles or your knees at all. And then also, when you lay on your slide to sleep, you need to have pillows between your legs to keep that leg from dropping down and touching the other leg if you're lying on your side. You need pillows between your legs. It's also more comfortable to sleep with pillows between your legs. Um, the last of those hip precautions is don't turn your toes way in or way out. When you lie on your back in the bed, it's very natural for your legs to roll out a little bit, and that's okay. It is not very natural to extremely rotate your leg outward. So, that's an easy one. What we're going to watch you on, though, is we don't want you to turn your leg inward at all. So, when you walk, we're going to practice keeping your toes lined up with your hips and shoulders and not twisting, and you need to avoid twisting your shoulders towards your surgery hip because that also turns your, your leg inward. All right. Now, for an anterior hip replacement, your incision is on the front of your hip, and so you need to be careful to avoid things that strain the front of your hip. So you're going to avoid having your shoulders behind your hip. You're going to avoid having your leg behind your body. So the things to do for that are to avoid taking a really large step with your non-surgical leg, and the good news is it's a lot more comfortable and easier to walk leading with your surgical leg and taking a smaller step with your non-surgical leg. So that's, that's good. Now, I mentioned before, when you lie on your back, it's very natural for your legs to roll out. That is too much for you. So if you're going to lie on your back in the bed, you need to keep your legs supported on the side so that your knee is pointed up at the ceiling. And you also want to keep the pillow under your knee a little bit so your knee is bent and your hip is bent just a little bit. And so that way you always can, can wiggle around because nobody lays completely still when you lie in the bed. And that will keep you safe with your precautions. I'd like to take a few more minutes to tell you about occupational therapy. Occupational therapists work with people on what we call activities of daily living. Those are the things that you do every day to care for yourself, like getting bathed, dressed, going to the bathroom, brushing your teeth, and a lot of people like to be able to do those things without assistance. So the occupational therapy will come and meet with you. They'll talk with you about how your bathroom is set up at home. They'll work with you to make sure that you're moving around and doing your bathroom activities safely and correctly while maintaining all of your uh, precautions. If the occupational therapist comes to meet with you and you've had all your questions answered and you're moving safely, you may see the occupational therapist just that one time. If there are things that you need to practice um, or learn how to do, 
you'll see occupational therapy in addition to physical therapy while you're here in the hospital. The occupational therapist can show you how to use some tools that can help make managing your hip precautions easier. Or if your knee is stiff and your back is stiff and you're having trouble reaching your feet, um, they've got some tools. It's called a hip kit, but I've had lots of patients find them very useful. It has a long-handled shoehorn, a long-handled sponge, some stretchy shoelaces, um, one of those little reacher grabber things so you don't have to bend over to pick things up. A lot of handy things um, that can be very helpful. A hip kit is typically not covered by insurance. It's another reason why it's nice to try to, to try to try out those tools first and then decide if that's something that you'd like to spend your money on or not. They cost about $30. They carry them in the gift shop or you can pick one up from um, an equipment supply store around town or order it online. So if you have any questions about therapy, um, give us a call before you come. You can ask your nurse or your therapist while you're here, or you can call us back um, once you go home if you have any other questions when you get home. We look forward to helping you recover from your hip and knee surgery. Hi, my name is Amy McGinnis, and I'm one of the nurses in case management at Redmond Regional Medical Center. I'll be following along when you're here with your total joint surgery for your discharge planning needs. There are several things that we need to review in order to pre prepare ahead of time for your surgery. When you're discharging home, you will need a family member or a caregiver to stay with you 24-7 uh, for several days to a week. This will ensure your safety once you go home because you will be a high fall risk after you have your total joint surgery. Also, there's another guideline that we ask uh, for you to go ahead and consider before surgery is uh, one restriction is you will not be able to drive for six weeks. This is uh, one of the instructions of your orthopedic surgeons. Um, you will, however, follow up with them in their office after your surgery. They may lift this re driving restriction uh, sooner than the six weeks but go ahead now and arrange for someone to drive you to all of your appointments, doctor visits, and to be able to run errands for you for at least six weeks. This is super important um, so that you can be in compliance with all of your follow-up therapy and all of your doctor's appointments for the best outcome possible. So in preparing for your discharge, there are a couple of different options our first option is outpatient therapy. If you're going straight to an outpatient clinic, we ask you go ahead um, and decide which clinic you want to go to and go ahead and call and make your first appointment. You know who's going to be your transportation and your schedule at home, and so it's a lot easier if you'll go ahead and now, before your surgery, call and make your first outpatient appointment for two to three days after your surgery. You will go straight to outpatient therapy and this is typically two to three times a week. There's another option um, that's available to some patients. It depends totally on your insurance, um, which would be home health. Home health is designed for when you um, are discharged home, your family will provide all of your care um, at home but we could arrange a therapist to come and do your treatments in your home. This is typically for one to two weeks, um, and then you would start outpatient therapy to follow that. So um, if you want home health, like I said, that's totally a, um, up to your insurance coverage if, if you have coverage for that. Um, so just be thinking about what insurance agents agency is in your network if you need in-home therapy. The third option uh, is skilled nursing facility. This would be either a swing bed. They uh, are considered a short-term in-house rehab facility or a skilled nursing facility which would be a nursing home that offers rehab in their facility. These uh, criteria are super strict. They are based on your need to be kept in a medical facility, so it usually has to be uh, approved by your insurance. 
If you have Medicare A and B, then you require to have a three midnight in hospital stay here at Redmond before you can transfer to a skilled nursing facility or swing bed. The process would be we would send the referral wherever you ask and then they have to review it and accept you. If they are accepting of you for rehab for their program, then you would transfer straight from here to their facility upon discharge. If you have a Medicare replacement policy, some examples of this would be United Healthcare Medicare, Blue Cross Medicare, uh, Humana Medicare. They do not require a three midnight in hospital stay. However, they are required to authorize this uh, transfer to a skilled facility as well. They're pretty strict, um, so I would always have a backup plan just in case your insurance doesn't approve you to go and stay in-house uh, as a transfer from here. Um, we have had that happen before. People are, they will say, I'm going to this facility, and then they're doing so well here, which we're proud that you're doing well here, but then you don't qualify to stay in an in-house rehab. So you always need to have family or someone that is able to help you at home 24 seven if this is not approved for a skilled nursing facility. All those beds are also based on availability. Um, so you wanna be super careful. You, if you're planning on going to a skilled nursing home rehab, call them ahead of time and tell them when your surgery is and then um, they can, we will send a referral once you are here um, in the hospital and they will already kind of be aware that you're having surgery and hopefully plan for you to come. If you're going to the swing bed, um, those beds are not guaranteed and so we will send a referral there as well and it will be based upon bed availability if we are accepted there. So having said all of these three options, with our orthopedic surgeons, we are hopeful that you can go straight to outpatient therapy. Um, that will get you moving faster back into a normal routine and back uh, into the outpatient therapy setting uh, quicker. Um, however, before your surgery, there, you need to call your insurance. And there's a piece of paper that I have in the back of your folder here um, that is basically the same guidelines as the whole thing I'm talking about uh, for your preparation. It's a checklist for you to have to choose your options and then call your insurance prior to surgery, check your benefits, and then I'm going to review about the equipment as well. So um, before your surgery, I really stress this because you need to check your insurance benefits. Um, you need to find out for any of those options, outpatient therapy, home health, or a skilled nursing facility or swing bed, you need to find out who is in network with any of these options you choose. Um, also, one thing that's very important, uh, especially for private insurance, uh, is do you have a limit of visits per year? And do you have a copay with any of these services uh, for outpatient, home health, or skilled nursing? Call your insurance ahead of time and ask these questions highlighted in your guide. If you don't, if you don't mind doing that, that will help you prepare ahead of time. Copays can range anywhere from 20, 30, 40 dollars per visit. Usually it's three times a week. And so that's quite a lot of money on the front side. Here at Redmond, we can offer um, for them to roll your copays onto your hospital bill if you stay within a Redmond outpatient facility. Those are located in Rome and in Cedartown. So you will have to call wherever you want to go and, and try to set this up ahead of time. All right, so one of the last things I want to talk about is your equipment. Your therapist, um, I'm sure you've already noticed she's talked about the equipment and the safety. And so you do have to have a walker when you leave this hospital. So we ask that you go ahead before surgery and uh, get your rolling walker, have it in hand with you when you come to the hospital. Um, you can do it a couple of different ways. You can have your orthopedic surgeon um, write a prescription 
and take that and your insurance card to any local durable medical equipment provider and have it filed on your insurance and get it that way. Uh, you can also purchase a walker or you can borrow a walker. So um, the best grade is to get from a local DME company uh, to ensure your safety. Make sure you have that in hand and have it labeled with your name on it um, when you bring it with you to the hospital. My name is Amy McGinnis again, and if you um, look on the bottom of the sheet that's provided in your folder, you will see my name and my phone number on that sheet. So between now and your surgery date, if you have any questions, you're welcome to call me and I will answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. I would like to start out by talking about what you need to do at your house to be ready to go home after surgery. First off, look around your house for any safety issues. And what I tell people is you know what your house looks like and you know what is around your house and in your house, but walk through your house, look at the floor, and is there anything that could trip you up? The first rule of thumb after a joint replacement is no falling. So make sure you have throw rugs picked up and out of the way. You're gonna be using your walker for anywhere from two to four weeks after surgery. So you don't want anything obstructing you and your walker to make you fall. So any throw rugs, any electrical cords that run across, and is there any kind of furniture that's close together that you might need to move apart to where you can fit through and you can walk through your house. So take a walk through and just know it's gonna be you and a walker going through your house and make sure there's enough room for you. Now, also you need to set up a recovery station. Where are you gonna be most of the time when you are getting over your surgery and you are recovering from your surgical procedure? That's not going home and going to bed and ringing a cowbell for your loved ones to wait on you hand and foot. We expect you to be up and about doing your therapy and doing your exercises. So most people set up a recovery station area in their den or living room area. Usually the best seat in the house in front of the TV. So make sure you have an area, a chair or a sofa, preferably with arms so you can get up and down easy. That is comfortable but not too soft because you don't want to sink down in it and not be able to get back up. So a comfortable but firm sitting area. And then um, you want a table or a tray or something you can put kind of your stuff next to you within your reach because you need stuff and you need things within your reach at all times. First and foremost, you need water. We encourage you to drink lots and lots of water after surgery. Water not only helps to hydrate you, it helps to prevent constipation. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's kind of how it is with surgery. You will be constipated some, but drink lots and lots of water. We all like snack foods. We encourage you to eat healthy snacks, high fiber snacks, fresh fruits and vegetables for snacks. We all like those potato chips, but don't just eat potato chips. Especially if you don't have your appetite back, it will come back if you don't have it at first. That's when you really want to make sure you're eating healthy snacks. You always want to have your telephone within your reach in case you need to reach the outside world. And then last but not least is the remote control. That's probably the most important. Then look in your bathroom. How is your bathroom set up? When the therapists come in and they're going to be talking to you about setting up your plan of care for you to be able to go back home, they ask you lots of questions about your bathroom. Do you have grab bars? Do you not have grab bars? Is, you, is it a walk-in shower? Is it a step over tub? Those are things that they need to know and it's just easier if you can have that in your mind or jot it down and bring it with you to the hospital in your folder then look around your kitchen. You're not gonna be cooking for a little while because your hands are gonna be on your walker, but when after a week or two, when you get to feeling a little bit better and you wanna kinda mosey into the kitchen, especially you women who like to cook, you want to go ahead and have things set on the cabinet within your reach. You don't wanna reach up real high or you don't wanna to have to bend down and reach real low because you definitely don't wanna fall. So prevent that, 
prevent from reaching by having everything that you normally need within your reach on the cabinet in your kitchen. Then your medications. The nurses that are doing your pre-admission testing and they're going over everything with you, they're going to be going over your medications and putting it in our computer. The day you come to the hospital, bring your medications with you in the bottles that they come in from your pharmacy. The nurse up here on the fourth floor, when they're getting you admitted to the floor to our joint center, they want to look at your medicines so they can compare your medicines, what is on your bottle, to the medicine that we have written in our computer system to make sure we have you on the right medicine, the right dose, at the right time. Now, your job. Look at your medication bottles. Do you take your medicine exactly how it's written on your bottles? If not, that's fine, but we just need to know how you take it. So make a sticky note and put it on that bottle or somehow some kind of note in the sack with your medicines to let us know exactly how you take your medicine. So we can let your orthopedic surgeon know what medicine you're on and exactly how you take it. So hopefully we will be continuing all of your medicines. There may be some of your medicines that you don't take while you're here at the hospital, but we'll go over that on an indi individual basis with you while you're here in the hospital. It is okay for you to take Tylenol at home, but if you're on a lot of herbal medicines, if you're on any kind of um, like vitamin E's and fish oil, then you need to talk to your doctor or talk to the nurse about when to stop taking those. And if you're on any blood thinning medicines, be sure to talk to your nurse or your doctor about when it's safe for you to stop taking that before your surgery. So the day before surgery, what do you need to pack? You're good, you may be here overnight. Some people actually go home the day of surgery. But I tell everybody, and I'm an overpacker, my husband fusses all the time, pack an, one outfit, and we want you to wear regular clothes, comfortable clothes, loose-fitting clothes, sort of like Thanksgiving clothes, something that's easy on, easy off, usually elastic waistband. It can be shorts, it can be long pants, nothing tight. No blue jeans, no khakis, something like workout clothes is perfect. Comfortable shirt, it can be a t-shirt, it can be long sleeves, short sleeves, whatever you're comfortable with, just bring some comfortable clothes. Don't forget your shoes and socks and don't forget your underclothes because we want you to get dressed just as if you're going outside because we're gonna walk you in the hallway, you're gonna be in the gym with mixed company so we gotta have private parts covered up. We want you to be able to do your exercise and we want you to be comfortable. The occupational therapist and the physical therapist will be going over with you how to say, how to safely get dressed and um, how they'll look at your shoes, no flip flops, because they're gonna look at your shoes and make sure they're safe and you are safe before you go home from the hospital. You also want to pack some chewing gum and that is part of our enhanced surgical recovery. After surgery, when you're in your room, I want your loved one who is with you to give you some chewing gum. Every time we walk in the room, we want to see you chewing gum. That helps with the dry mouth after surgery, but it also helps with post-op or after surgery nausea. It helps to kind of wake up your stomach and wake up your gut. It also helps with constipation. So whatever kind of gum that you like, bring your chewing gum and we want you to chew chewing gum. Also, if you have a CPAP machine for sleep apnea, be sure to bring your machine with you to the hospital. After you have your bags packed, there's a couple of things you need, still need to do at home. You want to change the sheets off your bed the night before surgery. Have fresh, clean sheets on your bed. Then we're going to give you a special pre-surgical scrub soap to use and the nurses in the pre-admission testing area are going to go over specific instructions of how to do that. But we want you to bathe the night before surgery with our special soap and then you're nice and clean when you get in the bed um, and you've cleaned your sheets so everything is nice and clean and then the next morning when you get up 
you will take another shower and use that special soap also. You also, we don't want you to eat anything after midnight. We do, we're giving you a special high carb drink and the nurses in the pre-admission testing are going over when for you to drink that. But basically, we want you to drink that high carb drink two hours before you arrive here at the hospital. So if you have to be here at 5.30, I'm talking about at 3.30, get up and drink your high carb drink. I know that's early, it's before the chickens get up, but that is to, that is another part of our enhanced surgical recovery. And that drink helps you not to feel so hungry um, when you're not able to eat anything, but it also helps to prevent post-op or after-surgery nausea. And if you smoke, we are a no, non-smoking facility and you might as well just quit smoking now. Pets, we all love our fur babies, but the night before surgery, after you've had your um, surgical scrub, your fur babies are not allowed to sleep with you. I know that's hard, but, um, but we have to make sure we're trying to prevent any kind of infection. So fur babies are not allowed to sleep with you that night. And then when you get home, just be very, very careful with special, especially little pets that they don't trip you up and make you fall. So just be aware of your pets. So the morning of surgery before you get here, I talked about taking your pre-surgical drink um, two hours before you arrive here and doing your surgical um, scrub. If you have any morning medicines that the nurses have told you to take and that you need to take before you get here, it's okay to take that with water. You don't have to take it with your um, surgical drink that we've given you because a lot of people say they would prefer to take their medicine with water and that's okay. Be sure to remove all your jewelry and we prefer you to leave your jewelry at home. When you get here the morning of your surgery, during surgery, your family will wait on you in our surgical waiting room. There will be a um, hospital staff member, very nice, will be talking to your family and keeping your family updated of what's going on. They will know when your surgery starts and they also will be taken to a private conference room for the doctor to talk to them after surgery to let them know exactly how your surgery went and how you're doing. You will be going to the recovery room. Surgery itself takes anywhere from one to about two hours. It just depends. You can talk to your doctor to find out exactly how he thinks, how long he thinks your surgery will be. And then you'll be in the recovery room at least an hour, sometimes a little bit longer. You have a nurse right there with you that is taking very good care of you while you're in the recovery room. And then you'll come up here to the joint center. Once you get up here to the joint center, our nurses will be checking you in. They will get your vital signs. They were gonna be looking at your dressing and they're gonna get you settled in. After you get up here to the joint center, the nurse will call your family to come up here. Your family, I know, wants to come see you and see how you're doing. And after they get up here and they see how you're doing and they're comfortable with everything going on, then they can go back to the car to get your bags that you packed and also your walker. Be sure you have put your name on your walker and you bring your walker with you so the physical therapist can use your walker while you're here at the hospital and make sure that your walker is safe and is the right size and the right fit for you. So that's why we request it here and they can bring it up here at that time. The nurses will give you um, clear liquids at first. They're gonna start out with liquids just to make sure you can tolerate the liquids. And then they will also be giving you a high protein drink because after surgery, we want you to be, make sure you're taking in a lot of protein. So we start out with high protein drinks and then we actually include a high protein drink with your meals. When you feel like you're ready for food, your nurse will be happy to order you a regular food tray. Just let your nurse know that I'm ready for food, I'm through with these liquids, and I feel good, and I'm ready to have some food. We are going to give you a Powerade to drink the day of surgery. We want you to drink at least one Powerade after surgery that helps to hydrate you. It also helps your kidney function. So in addition to the high protein drink, 
we want you to drink one Powerade the day of surgery after surgery. You will have lots of things connected to you when you get to the joint center. You're going to have IV fluids going in your arm. Those IV fluids will stay until after breakfast the, ne the next morning. That is to help hydrate you from surgery and um, it helps with any nausea also. We will, you will have oxygen in your nose. That doesn't mean anything bad. Oxygen in your nose, it helps you to feel better. It helps with post-op nausea. It is part of our enhanced surgical recovery that I keep referring to. But oxygen also helps to prevent infection. So we're gonna keep oxygen on you for that first night. You will have a, um, if you're having your knee replacement, you will have an ice on your knee. If you're having your hip replaced, you will, be told, you will be told by the nursing staff how to position your leg. Depending on if you're having an anterior hip or a posterior hip, and your doctor will talk to you about that, that depends on how your leg is positioned when you're in the bed. You will also have an incentive spirometer. We give you this incentive spirometer at your pre-admission testing appointment. We give it to you, show you how to use it, let you take it home, play with it, practice it, know how to use it. An incentive spirometer is the little breathing machine. It helps you to take a good deep breath, open up your lungs. It helps to prevent pneumonia and prevent any atelectasis in your lungs. So we want you to play with it, practice it. When you bring it back after surgery, we expect you to use your incentive spirometer every one to two hours during the daylight hours. You also will have what we call sequential hose wrapped around your legs. It squeezes one leg and lets go and it squeezes the other leg and lets go. This is to help your circulation and help prevent blood clots. In addition to the hose that are on your legs, the very first exercise that Sarah talked about is your ankle pumps, moving your ankles straight down and straight up. That is what you can do for yourself to prevent blood clots. We encourage you to do your ankle pumps the entire time after surgery when you're here in the hospital. And then even when you go home, especially when you're sitting watching TV, make sure you're moving those ankles up and down. That helps your blood flow up and down your legs and it helps to prevent any kind of blood clots. Your daily schedule here at the hospital is early morning. The nurses are getting you ready. They um, will be talking to you about your pain. Do you need something for pain? Before therapy comes, you'll get breakfast bright and early, and then it starts out with the occupational therapist. Their, the occupational therapist will come in, get you bathed, get you dressed. They're gonna show you how to get dressed and maintain any kind of precautions that you have for your surgery. So they kind of have some tricks of the trade that they'll show you and help you. And that's when, at that point, you need to tell your therapist any issues that you have seen when you were getting ready in your house so they can show you some things and tell you some tricks to help you be able to maneuver and get dressed and bathing at your house. Then the physical therapist will come in. They're going to take you to the gym. They're going to do your exercises. They're going to show you how to get in and out of a car. They're going to show you how to go up and down the steps. They're going to go over your exercises. You're going to know exactly what you need to do at home. And then you're going to walk in the hallway. If you are safe at that time, your physical therapist will let you know from the physical therapy standpoint, you're ready to go home. If you have questions about anything with your physical therapy, if you want your physical therapist to go over something a second time, you're not, the therapist says you're good, but you're not quite comfortable with something, tell your therapist, say, can I do that one more time? They are here to help you and to show you, and they would love to show you a second time and to review anything and practice anything with you. After surgery, we do a lot of things to prevent blood clots. Like I talked about was the ankle pumps, the sequential hose. You also will have some sort of medicine to prevent blood clots. We will go over that on an individual basis. I can't tell you right now what it is because everybody's a little bit different. So individually, we'll let you know what medicine you're on for blood clots. 
Um, we also, that's a, one of the reasons we get you up and get you moving and walk you actually the day of surgery. That helps to prevent blood clots also. We do encourage you when you go home to take stool softeners. If you're still a little constipated and having some issues, we encourage Miralax. And then if you need something further, you can take any laxative over the counter, whatever you've taken in the past, or you can um, call your medical doctor, or you can talk to the pharmacist. They're always happy to help you with what is best with what other medicines you are on. Continue using your incinospirometer even at home. And in addition to your incinospirometer, just make sure you take good deep breaths and make yourself cough to open up those lungs up until you're you're off your walker and you're back to normal, you still need to be using that incinospirometer and coughing and deep breathing. And while you're in the bed, you don't have to lay flat on your back. A lot of people think, well, after surgery, I can't move. You can turn on your side while you're here at the hospital, ask the nurses to help you and show you how to move and turn in the bed. And then once you go home, you, they will have shown you and you will know exactly how you can position yourself in the bed and still maintain all precautions that you need. One of the things that we are very adamant about is that you do not get up without one of us with you. What we do not want any falls in the hospital at all. We don't want you to fall at home either. So that's why we want you to call us, let us help you. We encourage your family while they're here to also help you, but let us help you let us show your family how to help you so no one gets hurt and you don't fall. Even though you feel like you've walked really good, you've walked down the hallway with physical therapy, and you think, well, I'm just going to go right there to that chair. I just want out of bed just a little bit. Do not get up unless one of us are with you because that's the time that's when someone will fall. So please call. Don't fall. And if you're getting up for anything at all, let us know, we're happy to help you. When you're here in the hospital, we're gonna be talking to you about preparing for your discharge. And you have all of this information in your folder. You also will be getting what we call a discharge folder. It's gonna have all the information you need of how to take care of your incision, when to change the dressing, how to change the dressing and you will have all of your follow-up appointments with your orthopedic surgeon, with your medical doctor. You have a physical therapy appointment also. So you will have all of that before you leave the hospital and it will be in your folder, in your discharge folder. You will have all that information and it, you will also have your pain medicine and we will actually talk to you about your pain medicine and how to take your pain medicine appropriately. So after discharge and after you go home, your daily routine is to do your ankle pumps about every two hours or so, especially if you're sitting down. Do your incinospirometer, do your exercises, cough and deep breathe, get up and walk. And if you're having your knee replaced, you want to put ice on your knee every 20 minutes out of the hour. Things to remember, do your exercises as instructed by your physical therapist. Before you leave the hospital, if there's any questions at all, pl please feel free to ask us so we can answer all of your questions before you leave the hospital. Of course, if you get home and have a question, feel free to call me and I will get the right person to call you back to answer all of your questions. Be sure to walk around frequently Walk short distances at first until you are comfortable with increasing the amount that you walk. Elevate your leg, especially if you're having your knee replaced, you want to elevate it and put ice on it um, uh, several times a day. You don't wanna sit with your legs hanging down all day long because then your ankles are gonna swell. So you wanna take a cat nap or a rest during the day and prop your legs up on the bed or on a sofa to, so your legs are not hanging down all day long. And then, please do not forget, if you are going to the dentist, you want to talk to your orthopedic surgeon about going to the dentist and whether your orthopedic surgeon wants you to take antibiotics or not before you go to the dentist, even with teeth cleaning. There's a lot of research going on about whether antibiotics are necessary or not before going to the dentist. As of right now, 
Your orthopedic surgeon does want you to take an antibiotic before going to the dentist office, even for teeth cleanings, to prevent any infection going to your joint. But have that discussion with your orthopedic surgeon and they will let you know what they want you to do. Anytime that you are sick or you feel like you're sick, be sure to go to your medical doctor. And when you go to your medical doctor, be sure to remind them, sort of like a broken record over and over, doctor, don't forget I had a joint replacement in whatever date your joint replacement was. So just be sure every medical personnel who's taking care of you knows that you've had a joint replacement. They know what to do to take care of it. Just be sure if they deem it necessary for you to have antibiotics, that you take all of your antibiotics as prescribed. And then if you're going to have another surgical procedure, have the discussion with that surgeon that you have had a joint replacement and they know what to do to prevent any infection on any joints that you've had. So just have that discussion so that they're aware that you've had a joint replacement in the past. My name is Michelle and I work with anesthesia. I'm gonna to talk to you today about your anesthesia as well as your pain medicines because anesthesia is the one that orders all that. So the day that you come in for your surgery, you're gonna check in at the outpatient desk and then they're gonna call you back and you will meet one-on-one -on -one with the anesthesiologist that'll be taking care of you for the day. You and him will go over all your history and all your home medications and together, the two of you will decide your anesthesia plan for the day. Now, typically for total hip replacements and total knee replacements, you will get a spinal for your anesthesia. Now, what a spinal is, is where the anesthesiologist will put some numbing medicine in your back. You will be completely numb from the waist down. You will also be sedated. So the first thing people think is, will I be awake during my surgery? You will be heavily sedated. You will not feel anything. You will not see anything, but you're awake enough that you can breathe on your own. Now you have the choice of doing general anesthesia or the spinal. I would say probably 95% of people do the spinal for total hip replacements. If you choose general anesthesia, uh, you will be put to sleep a little bit deeper. You will have to have a tube down your throat and you will be put on a ventilator. With a spinal, you will be able to continue breathing on your own. The numbing medicine that we give you for your spine on both legs will be completely numb. That numbness will last a good six hours, give or take. So you will be done with your surgery and be up to the floor before your numbing medicine wears off. So when your numbing medicine wears off, physical therapy will be in your room and they will start getting you up the day of your surgery. So as soon as you start getting all that feeling back in your legs, don't let it scare you when you wake up uh, or when you get up to the floor that your legs are still numb. That will go away, okay? Like I said, give or take six hours or so. Everybody's different. Um, you may also get what's called a nerve block whether you're having a hip replacement or a knee replacement. And part of that is for your pain control. Now, what that is, that's where the anesthesiologist will put some numbing medicine that goes to the leg, the nerve that runs down your leg, and that is to help control your pain. Now, our goal is not to numb your whole leg completely because then you couldn't get up and walk. Our goal is to just help with your pain. We use what's called a multimodal pain system here at, at Redmond. And what that means is we're gonna give you multiple types of pain medicines, multiple techniques to help reduce your pain. And our goal is to avoid as much narcotic opioid pain medications as possible. 
So we're going to start giving you pain medications and using techniques before you ever go to surgery. You're all going to get a dose of Tylenol. You're going to get um, some nerve medication. You're going to get an anti-inflammatory. You're going to get all that prior to going to the operating room. Now, the reason we give it before you go to the operating room is so that it has time to get in your system and be working. And after your surgery, you've already got a good blood level of all those medications. You will also get some of these medications automatically your first night. We're going to give those to you. Our goal is to try to keep a little bit of pain medicine in your system and not let it wear off. We will be waking you up in the middle of the night to give you pain medicines. That's so in the morning you will still have some pain medicine on board so that you can do your physical therapy. We want you to take enough pain medication so that you can do everything physical therapy asks of you to do. The better you do with your therapy, the better your long-term outcome is going to be. Now, you will have some pain medications ordered automatically. There will also be additional pain medicine that you can ask for if you need it. So just because we're giving you some doesn't mean that's all there is. Your nurses will, are going to ask you to rate your pain from zero to 10. Zero is no, no pain, 10 is the worst. Your orders are going to be that you can have one additional pain pill if you're hurting a one to five. You can have two additional pain pills if you're hurting six to 10. And then if you take all that and you're still hurting, we have a shot ordered for you, what we call a rescue shot that you can have. If you've taken all that, the nurses know how to get in touch with us. Um, the doctor's anesthesia is just a phone call away. Now, pain medicine can make some people sick at their stomach. And everybody's tolerance to pain medication is different. Some people need a lot. Some people can't tolerate it. So we're, our goal is to get your pain controlled with the oral pain medication so that we can get you sent home the next day. We need to figure out what works for you. Is it strong enough? Is it too strong? Is it making you nauseated? So if for whatever reason the pain medicine is not agreeing with you, you need to discuss that with your nurses early in the process so we can figure out what to send you home on. You're not going to be here very long. So don't wait until your surgeon makes rounds after surgery and you say everything's good and then it's time to send you home and you say, oh, that pain medicine kind of made me sick at my stomach. We need to know that before your surgeon writes your prescription to go home on. So communicate with us. We can always give you nausea medications to take with your pain medicines. And taking a little bit of food always helps also with um, helping your stomach with pain medicine. Um, after you go home, you will be in charge of your own pain medication. And another thing that helps tremendously preventing pain is ice. You can put ice on your incision. That helps prevent inflammation. That helps decrease your pain. You can use that several times a day. Um, it's good to take some pain medicine before you go to physical therapy so that you, know, you can do everything that they need to do. And you'll probably have to take some before you go too. Um, maybe take something at nighttime to help you sleep. You will gradually wean yourself off of pain medicine uh, you can also, after you go home, you can also combine anti-inflammatories like uh, Advil, Aleve, those types of things along with your prescription pain medicine because uh, that's what we're doing for you here. And that helps control your pain so that you can limit the amount of narcotic pain medication that you would need. Okay, now pain medication, all these drugs that we're giving you while you're here in the hospital, we need for your kidneys to be functioning well. What that means to you is I want you to be very well hydrated when you come to the hospital. Drink, drink, drink lots of fluids. We need you to drink fluids to flush all these medications out of your body. Uh, it helps to keep your blood pressure up. 
if you come to the hospital dehydrated and your blood pressure drops after surgery, we can't give you pain medication. So make sure you don't come to the hospital dehydrated. I would suggest drinking eight to 10 glasses of water the day before your surgery, as long as you're not on fluid restrictions. And then you're also gonna drink your surgical drink two hours before you arrive to the hospital. And then after your surgery, when you get up to the floor, we want you to drink, drink, drink lots of fluids too. Again, that helps prevent nausea, helps to keep your um, blood pressure up and helps you recover quicker. Okay, so if you have any questions between now and the day of your surgery, feel free to jot them down, bring those with you, because again, you will meet one-on-one -on -one with the anesthesiologist before you go over to the operating room. And you and him will have that one-on-one -on -one time that you can discuss any questions that you might have. Once again, we thank you for choosing Redman. My name is Michelle and I work with anesthesia. And if you have any questions, again, write them down to bring to the anesthesiologist or Beth Talbert has her card in your uh, folder and feel free to call her. She knows how to get in touch with us. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our video about our Total Joint program here at Redman. If you have any questions about anything, please feel free to call me. My name is Beth. My phone number here at the hospital is 706-802-3188. If I'm unable to answer the phone, I have voicemail. Please leave a message. I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And thank you for choosing Redmond.